Hello, and welcome to Bite Size Bible Study. I'm Pastor Nathan. On today's episode, we are going to start digging into the second major speech by Jesus, which we introduced last time, known as the Missionary Discourse. In today's episode, we're going to trace the developments of several major themes throughout the Gospel of Matthew, watch as Matthew explores who the people of God are, seek to uncover our purpose, and finally get an answer to one of the questions we've been tracking throughout the Gospel so far. Well, maybe we'll get an answer. All of this and more on this episode of Bite Size Bible Study. So grab your Bible, get a notepad ready, and make that fresh cup of tea. And let's dig into our scripture today from Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Let's hear these words. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Let's join together in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you this morning and we are so thankful that we get to explore your word, that we get to hear your commissioning of your disciples for mission, and Lord, that we get to experience that commissioning in our own lives today. We pray all of this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This particular section is the real start of the missionary discourse. It opens in our translation with these twelve which is a carryover from verses 1 through 4, where the 12 apostles are named and listed. Throughout, we will notice the emphasis is heavily upon the nation, land, and people of Israel. All three of these nouns are necessary to notice at the onset. Nation, land, and people. These represent at least three ways to understand what it would mean to be Jewish at the time of Jesus. Some of us can relate to this even today, while others of us, myself included, are far removed from this. For instance, my nation is the United States. My land is Florida or the United States. My people, however, aren't Americans because by people we are talking about ethnicity, literally in Greek, ethnes. And I am a mixture of English, German, and a few other things. So not all three of these things line up for me so that I am able to be in one place anywhere in the world where all three of these things are true of me at once, that I'm in that land as part of that people in that nation. But that's not so for the Israel of Jesus' day. You could be part of the nominal nation of Israel in the land of Israel and ethnically of the people of Israel, or in another manner of speaking, Jewish descent. This is important because what's about to be talked about extensively in this section is primarily Jewish concerns. Again, Jewish in nation, land, people, even faith. With that overview, let's dig into these verses. Verse 5. We have the 12 opening this verse, as we already mentioned, but then we have an interesting command placed immediately into this missionary discourse that sets the boundaries for where the disciples or apostles are to go. Jesus tells them, go nowhere among the Gentiles. In fact, the words used here in Greek actually mean don't go down the Gentile road or something similar. Was this a literal road Jesus had in mind, stretching from Capernaum on into Gentile territory? Very likely it could be. And Jesus was saying, don't go on that road. Or was this metaphorical and meant what our interpretation version means, go nowhere among them? Well, that could also very likely be true. Either way, the disciples were discouraged from being found among the Gentiles. 
This thought continues, however, to pull in also the Samaritans. The word used here in Greek and translated as town, as in enter no town, could also mean district. In other words, don't go anywhere inhabited by Samaritans. So now if we know some biblical stories, we remember the story of the good Samaritan. So clearly Jesus didn't think of all Samaritans as bad, but that story isn't in the Gospel of Matthew per se. In fact, this is the only reference to Samaritans in the entire gospel. And we know later in the gospel of Matthew, at the end, that Jesus commands the disciples to go into all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, proclaiming, baptizing, and teaching. So what gives Jesus? Well, Matthew has hinted at and foreshadowed a Gentile mission throughout the gospel so far. This is likely because by the time he was writing, his community and the church in general were already engaged in a Gentile mission. However, it seems pretty clear and compelling here in the gospel that Matthew understood Jesus first as the Jewish Messiah. Clearly the meaning, the Messiah who came first for the Jews, the nation, the land, and the people. This would exemplify a lot of things and check a lot of theological boxes for Matthew and the early Jewish community. First, one of the most important being that God, through Jesus, demonstrated covenantal faithfulness in first carrying the message of the gospel and the offer of the kingdom of God to the Jews. This tells everyone, including us Gentiles, that God is covenantally faithful. Second, that the resurrection of the Jewish Messiah means the eschaton, the age that gathers everything in at the end of time, has begun. By opening up this mission to the Gentile, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection all have paved the way for Israel, embodied by Jesus and now the disciples of this new kingdom, to live out the calling we find in the Hebrew scriptures to be a light to all the nations. Third, and finally, notice the order we find here. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only the household of Israel. This is the inverse of the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel. Go to Israel, Samaria, and the whole world. Matthew sets up with these stories a very wide chiastic structure with Jesus and the disciples' ministry in the middle. Matthew closed off peoples and nations in a certain order. And the inverse of this order will be how ministry gets opened up to them according to Matthew's understanding. For Matthew, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is the turning point in ministry. It's the turning point. It's the the crux. It's the turning point. It's that, that fulcrum at which everything turns in the story. Before that point, the ministry is only to the Jews. But after that point, it's to everyone. Let's move on to verse 6. The lost sheep of Israel, some have suggested, are only those in Israel who are suffering. But because Gentiles and Samaritans seem to be all-inclusive of the whole of the people group, we should likely understand the term Israel in this way also. All of Israel has been led astray like lost sheep by its religious leaders and rulers. We've already seen this imagery and metaphor at work in Matthew. Verse 7. We hear in this verse a retelling of the same calling that John the Baptist has exhibited and that Jesus pronounced at the beginning of his ministry. This same calling, to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near, is to also be the work of the disciples. It's our work. In this way, Jesus' ministry is the disciples' ministry and is our ministry. And it's all about the kingdom of heaven being made near and being made real on earth as it is in heaven. The ministry and proclamation have not changed. In the person of Jesus, heaven has come to earth and is being made real, made manifest through him, through the disciples and through us. And this is the big question we've been tracing. Here we have an answer, but we will continue to trace the development of this answer through the rest of the gospel. The question is this, what is the relationship between our ministry and Jesus' ministry? Well, it's the same. Not just that Jesus will commission us to do the same things, but our ministry is the same as Jesus' ministry. Notice I say as Jesus' ministry and not as Christ's ministry. There's a a big theological difference between those two terms. But the ministry that the person Jesus came to do to proclaim the kingdom of heaven and to embody it as far as he was possible, which he could do perfectly, that's our ministry. We are to embody the kingdom of heaven and proclaim its nearness 
and we're to do it as well as we possibly can. It will be imperfect, but we're still to do it. Moving on to verse 8. What things does making the kingdom of heaven real now entail? Well, the same things we saw Jesus do in chapters 8 and 9 for these apostles. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. The authority that Jesus gave to the 12 at the beginning of this chapter in verse 1 was freely given. So don't charge people for these services. The disciples aren't to be traveling magicians with a magic spell or potion that town people can come out and buy and pay to see and then have access to. No, this authority to do these things is a gift from God and so should be given to others without payment being expected in return or even taken. The disciples don't have that authority unless he gives it to them. So why would they charge for an authority that isn't even theirs? Let's move on to verses 9 and 10. We'll take these together because they go together. Verse 9 and 10 describe the conditions of the workers of the kingdom on the journey. The journey is what's called an itinerant one, a traveling one. One that sees the workers traveling on and on, moving from place to place. And the other gospels, only one type of money, silver or copper, was mentioned. But Matthew mentions gold, silver, and copper, all three types of coins they would have had access to. Why? Because the disciples can't expect to be highly paid or to be middle income individuals from their ministry or even just to be scraping by with poor compensation. No, they're going to receive no pay. Everything they have will be dependent on the Lord providing through those to whom the disciples minister. They aren't to take two tunics or extra clothes or even wear sandals. Some have suggested this means take an extra pair of sandals, but the Greek seems clear that they shouldn't be wearing any footwear. Why? Perhaps to indicate their complete poverty on the journey, or to help them raise awareness that every step is important and sacred. I think it's that last point, the sacredness of the calling, that is perhaps the best fit for understanding this. It's almost as if carrying out the mission of God means living in the divine presence, a la Moses and the burning bush. And thus, no sandals are allowed on sacred holy ground. Hmm. Well, they are also to be told to take no staff. A staff could be used to help walk, but its most important function was to fend off robbers and wild animals on the road. The disciples were called then to be extreme pacifists. Don't even take a thing that you would be tempted to use for protection, no matter what. Now, what sorts of ways do we or do we not embody extreme pacifism in the church today? And how does that jive with the calling Jesus places on his disciples? For laborers deserve their food meshes almost perfectly with a verse found in James. And that James copies Luke indicates that Luke, Matthew, and James all likely had a similar source or that James used Luke in his writing. You might notice if you read along carefully, though, that I skipped the beginning of verse 10 in the phrase, no bag for your journey. Well, that's because we don't understand this word very well in the English translation. It likely refers to the sort of bag that travelers would wear that would hold a loaf of bread so that they would at least have that to eat and not starve. Is there a more appropriate way for Jesus' disciples to live out their total dependence on God for all of the day's sustenance, such as we talked about the true meaning of the words daily bread in the Lord's prayer as, as this. Jesus tells his disciples to completely embody that part of the prayer. Move on to verse 11 with me. This verse has town or village in it, and it echoes Jesus' ministry to the towns and villages earlier. The word worthy doesn't mean moralistically, objectively worthwhile, but rather someone who is open to receiving the message, the proclamation of the gospel, the nearness of the kingdom of heaven. This and not some internal or external factor makes one worthy. By staying in one house, it makes the human tendency to compare homes or lifestyles a moot point. If you're only in one house, you only know one house, and then you don't compare one house to the other and be tempted or feel tempted to give one person preferential treatment in the kingdom. So stay where you are welcome as long as you stay in that one place. For this reason, we can read all of what happens in Capernaum, I think, from the lens that it happened in Peter's home. Verse 12. Greeting the house is a strange turn of phrase expressing the Jewish thought to speak shalom to a home or peace. 
to offer shalom would be very Jewish. But given the eschatological setting that Matthew brings to this story, it seems to me that what would be thought of as a Jewish idiom might be more of an eschatological foretaste. For the kingdom of heaven will be one of absolute peace. The peace of the kingdom of God is now being wished, blessed, and embodied by the disciple in the home or upon the household or to the family where that person is staying. Whatever home you go into, bring peace. Wow. What a word for Jesus' disciples today, you know? If you enter someone's home and you don't bring peace into it, well, you're not embodying the kingdom of heaven for them very well. Verse 13. If the household, not the house, but the household is worthy of it, meaning they are open to the proclamation of the gospel, then this wish for peace will be welcome. If not, no matter, you haven't lost anything by offering peace because you embodied the kingdom of God. A disciple cannot lose their peace by offering it to others, even when it is not welcome and won't take hold. Instead, that peace remains with the disciple, as they know they did everything they were called to do by their Lord. Verse 14. This particular verse flows out of some very viewish thoughts and behaviors. Jews, as they return to their homeland from traveling abroad outside of the country or into Samaria, would stop at the border and brush or shake the dust off of their shoes so that the land of foreign gods would not contaminate Jewish soil. I told you we were going to talk about Jewish land also today. Jews of Jesus' time would not want to introduce anything that would be defiling of their God into their land. In the same way, a household or town who rejected the disciples and Jesus' proclamation would be considered to be unworthy, and you don't want to carry their soil with you into another place. An English phrase that might get the point across is, if they don't want it, let them sit with it. Verse 15. This last verse in this passage demonstrates how thoroughly Jewish this passage has been. Rather than a lessening of the penalty against Sodom and Gomorrah, which was much less mentioned than Sodom, it will be considered a more grave offense to have rejected the peace and message of the kingdom of God on the day of judgment. If the proclamation of the kingdom gets rejected, it's worse than the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And by the way, side note, for most of history, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah have been considered to be their vile ways culminating in their inhospitality. Inhospitality, then, is the major sin against Sodom and Gomorrah. Both were destroyed in ostensibly the finality of their sin for rejecting the holy messengers sent to them. In the same way, those who reject the proclamation of God will get punished for their inhospitality of the messengers, the holy messengers sent to them. This is actually a great parallel in Jewish thought for understanding how people would be understood by the disciples with their inhospitable responses. All right, so we've quickly gone through all the verses, but what does it all mean? Well, we must remember that Matthew was writing in the post-resurrection, post-ascension, post-Easter world. For Matthew, the gospel had already gone out, probably even from his own community to the Gentiles. So why was there so much emphasis in this passage on going first to the Jews and all of the Jewish customs? That's at least in part because Matthew wanted his community to understand and remember their roots. It's not that the message went first to the Jews and then it dramatically changed when going to the Gentiles. No, the message is still the same. The message is still the kingdom of heaven has drawn near in the person of Jesus Christ. So come and be gathered into the kingdom. You are welcome here. That's the message for Matthew's day, and it's the message for our day, and that we're to share with others. The results for his community, who had just been inhospitably treated by their synagogue and had their people forced to leave it, would be considered much the same as Jesus' disciples being rejected. It's, it's much like our rejection or failure to be a people of grace who are worthy of the message in our lives today. And this section would answer some nagging questions in the minds of Matthew's community, Namely, what happened to those people who reject the message? And how did the message get outside of the Jewish community? And does this change anything for us? It also answers some questions for us, the biggest being, what does it mean to be a worker in the kingdom? It means to be one who relies entirely on the providence of God. It means to be a pacifist, and it means to offer peace as the foretaste of the kingdom wherever we go. We cannot call ourselves followers in the way of Jesus, workers of the harvest, unless we do these things, because his instructions were very clear. 
And so I think this last one, bringing peace wherever we go, I think that's the message for us today. We must return to understanding the peace of the kingdom and allowing it to reside in our hearts and permeate throughout our entire lives. And my prayer is that that peace is known by you today and by all who you encounter. Will you join me in praying? Almighty God, let us be filled with your peace. Let us be known by your peace. Let us bless each household we enter into and let us carry the message that your kingdom has come near in Jesus Christ, and that we are carriers of this kingdom. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining me in this bite-sized Bible study. I'll see you next time. For more content like this or to partake of the other offerings Oakhurst United Methodist Church provides on a weekly basis, like this video and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to share this video on all of your social media platforms.